in policy dispute resolution and business negotiations, and he's also on the adjunct faculty at St. Louis University, also here in St. Louis, teaching negotiations. He has a Master's of Law in Organizational Leadership and Conflict Management, his law degree from St. Louis University, and his Bachelor of Science in Administration of Justice. Please welcome our speaker this afternoon talking about the 10 things guaranteed to escalate conflict and how to avoid them. Jim Reeves. And that was actually just a ploy to get at least a little bit of applause today. <laughs> welcome to all of you. Uh, I know you've just finished lunch, so we'll try to keep the conversation lively. We've got an hour and a half to talk about some things that, um, you know, we're at the Steel Conference. and. Um, but I want to tell you right up front, everything we're going to talk about today, try this at home. This isn't just about business, this is about relationships. And I'm going to tell a few stories about relationships that have nothing to do with steel or business or anything else. Um, because it does apply. Um, my wife would tell me that I really stink at this stuff. I do everything that I'm going to tell you not to do. Uh, and I try. I, I try really hard, but I'm going to ask you, please, from now on, to keep these things in mind that we're going to talk about, and um, uh, hopefully it will be helpful. If you can take away just one or two good nuggets after this hour and a half, uh, that's my goal. So we're going to be talking about 10 things that guarantee to, uh, to, to uh, escalate conflict. And I can tell you, I've, I've been a mediator, I, I sit at the end of a table. And, and, and I watched thousands of people in 27 years negotiate. And those negotiations are not deal making. Typically, if they're in front of a mediator, they're in conflict situations. And that's really the context in which we're going to talk this afternoon conflict. And this topic came to me some years ago, and I thought, you know, this is so interesting. Uh, what one person does on one side of the table impacts the person on the other side of the table. And if it's a negative interaction, then that negative interaction tends to be returned. And things get out of control really fast. Things escalate. In my prior law, uh, law life as a trial attorney, uh, I tried a lot of cases in front of juries, and I gotta tell you, most of those, yeah, maybe not most, but a large percentage of those cases could have been resolved if somebody sat down and talked. And instead they spent four or five years litigating a case with hundreds of thousands of dollars in costs and a relationship that was once theirs gone. And so I thought, you know, this might be a good forum to talk about some of the things and some of the observations that I've seen that escalate conflict so that I can make you aware of it and then when your business dealings, you can kind of step back and say, well, hold on. I remember a talk by this guy named Reeves who said, eh, don't go there. Do something else. So those are the kinds of things. The other thing is I know that a lot of you are, or actually all of you in this room, live in a world of precision. You're building buildings, you're building bridges, you work in the steel industry. That's a precise industry. I mean, I look out the window, which we don't have in this room, but another room, and I look at the Gateway Arch. I grew up in St. Louis. I watched that thing get built. It's an incredible phenomenon, and the precision. Where I'm going with this is, I'm not sure I only have top 10 things that cause es uh, escalation and uh, conflict. <coughs> I think I have closer to 12. So, Please don't hold that against me, and there's no extra charge if there are a few extras. So here's my question to you. In business or in personal relationships, have you ever had one of those conversations that seemed to start out just fine? It's, you know, it's, it's starting out okay, and then something happens, and by the time you leave the conversation, it's just gone to pieces. There's screaming, there's yelling, there's name calling, there's this high emotion, there's anger, there's frustration. And you get out of that scene and you think, oh man, what happened? What the heck just happened? 
And the amazing thing about these kinds of conversations in a conflict situation is emotions take us over and we lose control. And then we wake up out of this fog and we go, what went wrong? So today I want to talk about some things that typically go wrong. Because as we're going to talk today, you are going to find out that one of the key things, one of the foundational points we're going to talk about today is awareness. Awareness of yourself. Now, the moderator just told you I teach at two law schools here in St. Louis. I've been teaching, I've been uh, talking at this conference for, I don't know, eight years? I don't know. I've, I've been following the conference all over the country. It's such a spectacular group of people. And I think right for the kinds of conversations that we have at these uh, seminars. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're taking a look at these conversations and a few foundational points. One is all of us in this room value business relationships. One of the things that I've noticed in the conflict world is that when those emotions come and they overcome us and we lose the ability to think, relationships go out the window. We forget about how important those relationships are. In business, those relationships are money, they're projects, they're referrals, they are valuable. We also have personal relationships that are valuable in a whole different way. And so at the core of what we're going to be talking about, one of the cores, one of the foundations, is relationships. Anybody know what this is called? Newton's Cradle. Newton's Cradle. There's probably a scientific name for it. I don't know it because I'm not a scientist. But Newton's Cradle is what it's commonly called. What happens when you take that ball on the left and you drop it? One on the right that goes up. There's one ball on the right that goes up. That single ball hits the other four balls, but only the ball on the right goes up and comes back down, hits the other four balls, and then the ball on the left <coughs> swings out and hits the balls, and it goes back and forth and back and forth until it runs out of energy, or energy disperses, or whatever the scientific term is, it won't go on perpetually. But the point here is, and another foundational term that I want to think about, concept, is this idea of the rule of reciprocity. Now, a lot of you have heard of the rule of reciprocity. It's an exchange. Economics, markets, business, is all about reciprocity. I do something for you, you do something for me. And we go back and forth. And out of that relationship builds a stronger relationship, perhaps trust. But we both get an exchange of value. This demonstrates that idea of relationship and the idea of reciprocity in the realm of influence. I just told you a moment ago that my observations as a mediator, I see one person behave a certain way and I see a reaction from the other side of the table. It's like a human Newton's cradle. And it's fascinating because one of the things that we sometimes are frustrated about is you think, oh gosh, this person's being so unreasonable and they're wrong and I'm right and you know, you get all upset about this and the thing is, is we cannot change people. We can't change them. But we can influence them. The beautiful thing about Newton's cradle and the rule of reciprocity and our ability to influence is that when we react in a certain way, we can influence those around us through our words, through our tone, through our nonverbal communication, we can influence what happens across the table. Can't change them, but we can influence them. And so when conflict escalates, we're going to see in just a minute, what happens is we or the other person on the other side of the table does something 
to make us mad. It emotes emotion. We react in an emotional way, and they in turn react back to us in a like way. And things get out of control really, really quickly. So there's Newton's cradle and our ability to influence. This is a very simple chart. You have person A over here, person B over on the right, and basically, here's what happens. I do something to you. You perceive it as a threat. Your first reaction is an emotional one. Why? Because you're human. Your first reaction is to lash out, fight or flight, and by golly, you're going to fight. So when you react to me, then what happens is, now I perceive a threat, and I react to you as though I have been threatened. And you can see how this escalating cycle can happen. Our job here is to break that cycle. How are we going to do it? Through awareness. Think about a time when you've had a conversation that just didn't go well. I don't care if it's a coworker, a colleague, a business partner, a personal partner, spouse, family member, whoever it might be. I'm not gonna ask you to disclose anything. You can tell me if you want, but I'm not gonna ask. But my question to you is, think about that conversation. And I want you to think about, at what point did you realize things weren't going well? Specifically, what did you see and what did you feel? By the way, going back to the comment about teaching in law schools, I teach law students. I ask my law students when they're doing simulated negotiation exercises and conversations outside of class, I say, folks, I want you to pay attention to how you feel. And I gotta tell you, asking law students to feel emotion and pay attention to that, that's kind of an odd thing. Because <coughs> I'm a lawyer, I know that, you know, emotions are not allowed in the law. It's about the facts and the law. And I'm just getting any lawyers in the room. None, really? It's open game. This is awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna ask law students, hey, you know, pay attention, and that's what I'm going to ask you to do, is pay attention to what's going on and how you're feeling in these difficult negotiations, these difficult conflict situations. And pay attention to what's going on on the other side of the table. What you will see is some level of emotion, and I want to talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. Some level of emotion. It could be anger. It could be frustration. Their face is turning red, they're frowning, they're getting unhappy, they're getting agitated. Tension in the voice. I realized this some years ago with my wife. She has three sisters. She's the oldest of four. And very early on in our relationship, when I was invited to family gatherings and all the sisters were there, it was so interesting to watch because here's what I saw. My wife, the oldest sister, right? I know from their stories that she was a brute to those kids. I mean, she was horrible to them. You know, big sisters. I don't know how many older siblings there are in the room, but I have my little brother. So when they started having conversations, the tension in their voice, even when they were just talking about what to have for dinner, the tension in their voice would go up a little bit. The tone in their voice would go a little bit higher. It was so interesting, and one day I pointed it out to her. I said, you know, whenever you talk to Susie or Carolyn or Norma, I said, it is so interesting how that voice tone changes. Really, she said. I said, yeah, pay attention. And she did. She says, my God, you're right. That happens in tense conversations. When we're nervous, we're upset, we're getting angry, we're getting frustrated, the tension in our voice begins to creep in. Your jobs 
in these scenarios is to pay attention to that. Something is not going well. The other thing I want to point out is the non-positive gesturing. We see this, yes, sir. Sorry, what, what do you do about it if there's tension in your own voice? We're, we're going to get there. Yeah, thank you. Yep. This is just kind of things to watch out for. Yep, gotcha. So, and make sure I answer that question, okay? We have till, till 3 o'clock and you make sure, please. So, the other thing is non-positive gesturing. A lot of us have driver's license. We've been cut off, right? You know, and the non-positive gesturing that may happen. A lot of it is digital. <laughs> and I don't mean pixels. But, yeah. Pounding the table. Pounding the fist. Waving the arms. Getting agitated. Signs of escalation. Name calling. It can be simple as some crass name. It can also be as simple as you're being unreasonable. Look what I'm doing with my finger. You're unreasonable. You're not saying the proposal is unreasonable. You're unreasonable. It's a personal attack. That's a sign of escalation. And then the outright threats. Do it or else. That's a problem. Now, I also have on there that emotions can be good, and here's why. Emotions often are a key to something going on with the other person. When they're mad at you, your question, your first thing is to ask a question, and that is, what's going on? And we're going to talk a little bit about that when we talk about curiosity. But I just want to give you, A, what that looks like in terms of escalation and the cycle of escalation, and also some of the key things to look for. When this stuff starts happening, something ain't right, and it's time to step back, and we'll address that. Here's the awareness, Peter. This is exactly what I said to you a few minutes ago. And that is being aware of what's going on. We tend to go into autopilot. We just tend to react on an emotional level. Our job here, and we'll talk about how to do this, is to engage our brain. If our brain can react a split second faster than our emotion, then we can manage this and influence the conversation in a positive way. So, let's start with one of the ways we escalate. One is having different conversations at the same time. I don't know if you all are aware of this. You've probably all experienced this, and maybe you weren't even aware of it. But you have a conversation, and you start down this path, and you realize that person is not talking about the same thing I am. I'm talking about something different. And the interesting thing about it is it's a really frustrating experience. So we go through this conversation, and somebody's getting upset and we realize wait a minute I thought you were talking about X no I'm talking about Y oh I get it now I see the other way we have different conversations is that these conflict conversations have a lot of layers something will happen something in the field something with the deal something will happen that will trigger the conflict, that's the issue that we're going to talk about. And everybody assumes that that's really the issue that we need to talk about. Well, of course we need to talk about it. The problem is, nine times out of ten, as human beings, there's a whole lot more to talk about. There are layers. There are personalities involved. There are egos involved. There are hidden agendas involved. There are all kinds of things that people don't necessarily talk about across the table, but they're part of the conversation. Let me give you an example. That is a giant meatball. I know probably not appetizing right after lunch, perhaps before lunch it would have been better, but that's a giant meatball. And here's why I'm talking about it. Once upon a time, my wife, who works full time, she's also a lawyer, she came home from work one evening and she looked like she'd been through the ringer. I said, sweetheart, what happened? She said, I had a day from hell. Oh, man. I said, 
what do you want to do? She says, let's just go out to eat, let's have a glass of wine. Let's do it. Great. So we headed out. There was a new Italian restaurant that had opened up not far from our house. And we went there. In the car, she said, you know, I didn't even have time to eat. I'm starving. People are crazy. Blah, 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 blah. I said, all right. She said, Let's get something to eat. So we go to the restaurant. She orders a salad. Not a big salad, but a little salad. And I said, I ordered the meatballs. They were about that size. They were huge. They were the size, two of them, the size of bowling balls. I said, oh my God, I'm going to eat this. This is huge. Meanwhile, she's talking about her day. I'm trying to be a good listener. I don't say a word other than kind of acknowledge, maybe ask an occasional question. And somewhere in there, she finishes her salad. I said, sweetheart, do you want one of these meatballs or a part of something? And she says, no, 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 thanks. I said, I mean, I'm not going to eat all of this. We should have some protein. No, no. She keeps talking. A few minutes later, sweetheart, damn, you've got to get something else to eat. This is horrible. I said, you know, let me just cut off a piece of, she said, I, I don't want any meatball. Just, I don't want any meatball. All right. She keeps talking, have a glass of wine. We actually wound up finishing a bottle of wine. I said, sweetheart, come on. You had nothing to eat all day. Have something more substantial to eat. She says, I don't want any of your damn meatballs. Escalation. What? Of course, how do we react to that? I step back. I said, you know, now I'm the victim, right? Okay. My intentions are out of love. I care about you. Do I say that? No. I just fall silent. The impact of my conversation was nothing more than to just to annoy her. So it was a pretty quiet night in our household that night. We got up, we paid the bill, we went home, we went to bed, we got up the next morning. I'm standing out in the kitchen, having coffee, she gets up, she pours coffee, she comes over, she gives me a hug. She said, you know, sweetheart, I'm sorry. It wasn't about the meatball. And I said, I know that. And I know better. We were not talking about the meatball. We were talking about, we weren't even talking about her day. She just needed a sounding board. She needed to unload a bunch of crap from the day. And that was it. We were having two different conversations. I was talking about concern. She was talking about her day and wanting to be listened to. The substance of the conversation, folks, didn't make any difference. It was about being there. In our business relationships and our personal relationships, I told you this can work at home, we've got to pay attention that if something's not going right in a conversation, we've got to step back and start to think, is something else going on here? Are we having different conversations? And maybe that's a good time to ask a question. You know, what I'm thinking is blah, 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 blah. I'm thinking, are you okay because you haven't had anything to eat? She says, she would say, you know, just ask that question. Let me answer. I am really fine. And no, I don't want to eat. Well, I just want you to listen. That'd be great. De-escalation done. So, multiple conversations, pay attention, and think about if something's not going right, are we all talking about the same thing? History. This is a big one. I have worked with so many people who have come into conflict, not just about because of the presenting issue, but because of the past issue. The one that was never resolved. The one that they never talked about. Because, you know, as we've heard, time heals all wounds. Sometimes that's true. Most of the time, I would say 75 to 85% of the time, that wound becomes an elephant. And it's an elephant in a room, and it starts off as a little baby elephant, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows over time. 
until it explodes at the most inopportune times. And so one of the things we want to do is think about the business relationships. Who is it we're going in with whom we are going into business? Have we had a history before? Have there been some problems in that history before that have not been resolved? Do they need to be resolved? Do they need to be discussed? I was working with a company recently who was having some difficulty. It's a flooring company. They do uh, business around the world. And they were having difficulty with a supplier. They'd had this business relationship for 25 years. And their last negotiation, their supply chain negotiation, did not go well. So they said, would you come in and just kind of bounce some ideas? Let's, let's just talk. So I met with the CEO and the and general counsel and a product manager. Like we had about six people in the room. I said, tell me about this relationship. That's a long time. What the heck happened all of a sudden? And so they start filling me in on some of the history. And sure enough, way back when there was this issue that has been sort of pushed under, never fully resolved, but seemed to, to have popped their, its head up, not fully, but a little bit, during this last negotiation. He said, oh, what's going what's to happen to that? Well, I, I don't know. It's just, you know, it'll, it'll go away. I said, it's not going away. It's getting bigger. Because if it had been around for years, and it popped up during this last negotiation, you better deal with it. So how are we gonna do this? Well, we walked through some ways. It just so happens they had an opportunity to play golf with these people. They're gonna blow off this, this golf outing with this company representatives. I said, why? Well, we don't, want, we don't want to deal with those people. I said, oh yeah, you do. Otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here. You have a business relationship and it's a good lucrative one. You do want to deal with them. And I think this is a great conversation to have on a golf cart over a couple of beers maybe have it. And they did. And they worked it out. And at that point, it wasn't a big deal anymore. So, beware of history. This happens in our personal relationships. You've had these conversations where, you know, you're having a conversation about X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, the person with whom you're talking, or maybe it's you, and you think, see, there it is. you're doing it again. Doing what again? What are you talking about? No, no, no. You do this all the time. Or you did it to me last year. Or you did it to me last week. When you start hearing stuff like that, it's called a time I said, you know what? We need to deal with that. And it's a whole different conversation. Can we deal with that? If not right now, like soon, is that okay? And sometimes, even acknowledging that it exists and acknowledging that you're willing to talk about it is enough, sometimes. So history. I've had management positions, and I'm one of those weird managers who loves performance appraisals. Not because I love to bash people, but because I see it as a coaching opportunity. And a lot of managers that I've talked with and worked with, because it's kind of a negotiation, they hate them. It's so negative. I don't want to do this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the employee's performance down on a piece of paper. I'm going to give it to them. Then they can have some written comment, and then we'll all sign up. That way, I don't have to deal with them. In a conflict situation, people feel really uncomfortable in conflict. It tends to be negative. So what happens is, it doesn't exist. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with that person. The problem is twofold. One is, whatever the issue is, doesn't get taken care of. Two is, it's terrible on your relationship. I don't know how many of you in this room have been avoided, or you've been in the position where you've avoided someone else. I have. And it's really uncomfortable, especially if it's a colleague or a business partner. How do you do that? How do you do business? Have the conversation. Set up a time, set up a place, make it informal, get it out of the business realm if you have to, but figure out a time 
and a way to have the conversation that needs to happen. Because this is going to be a classic escalator. Things that aren't dealt with get bigger. It is that elephant in the room that grows and grows. It doesn't go away. It gets bigger. And then it explodes at bad times. So have those conversations. Don't put your head in the sand. Mind readers. How many mind readers do we have in the room? A couple of them? Yeah. All right. What are we going to say next? That's right. Good. I don't know what it is about people in conflict. It's amazing. And I've had this observation for years. But there's something about being in conflict that gives us this omniscient sense. I know exactly what that other person is going to do to me. I know exactly what their motivations are. I know how they're going to screw me over. I know what they're going to do to me next. And the interesting thing is, I don't. I may have a suspicion, and that suspicion may even be right, depending on the nature of the relationship and the context. But the number of assumptions and mind reading that I see happen across the table, how do you know that? Part of my job as a mediator is to step back and help that person step back and ask questions. I said, so, so tell me about this interaction. Tell me about this conversation. How do you know that? What, what have they said to you or done to you that makes you think that? Well, I just know them because it's them, and I know exactly what they're thinking. Tell me more about that. I want to hear about that. And before long, they realize they can't read minds. I want you, please, from now on, when you're in one of these difficult conversations, to pay attention. Are you trying to read someone's mind? Are you making assumptions about what they're thinking? Theories are OK. Theories require proof. Theories require facts. You get facts and proof through asking questions. What are you thinking? There's a good question. I saw this and I heard this. Here's what I'm thinking you're thinking. And I've had those conversations. Is that right? No, 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 no. I'm thinking completely different. My intent is completely different. I want this to work. These mind readings in a conflict situation also tend to be negative human nature. It's us against them. And so when we start to attribute evil motives, negative motives to the other side, then we are going to go into defense mode. And we will react accordingly. No mind reading. Closely related to that is the idea of assumptions. I'm amazed at the assumptions we make about each other in a conflict situation. And I want you to be aware of the assumptions that you make. I want you, please, from now on, to ask yourself some questions. What do you know? And what do you think you know? The think you know question begets theories. I think I know this about that other person. I think I know that about what they're going to do next. But that's a theory. The key part of this is theories are fine. Assumptions, you've made a decision about something negative about the other side, about the other person. And then what tends to happen is we then act on that. We act on that negative assumption. And that is going to be behavior that we are going to influence that other person negatively. And we're going to start that cycle because they're going to, ne they're going to come back at us. Especially when our assumption was wrong. Because they're going to be so taken back by our negative behavior, and they're going to be not only hurt by our behavior and defensive because of our behavior, but it's going to escalate very quickly because they're saying, I did not deserve that. How dare you? 
So beware of those assumptions. Be very clear in your own mind, is this something I know or something I think I know? And that's a critical decision and a critical distinction. By the way, if any of you have other questions, please. I love politics. I love to talk about politics in socially inappropriate settings because it's fun. I like to do it because politics to me, I'm not so interested in politics in and of itself, but to me it's all one huge negotiation. A lot of it flops, some of it works. I listen to talk radio on every spectrum there is, every single spectrum. It's fascinating to me. It's fascinating to me because at some level, and this is my mediator mind working, everybody says the same thing. Very differently, but everybody says the same thing. What happens is the real issues, the real questions get buried in a lot of stuff. The real concerns, the real problems we're trying to solve. And that's true in conflict situations. I have a very dear friend of mine who loves to entertain. She's uh, she has cocktail parties, you know, dinner parties, and that sort of. She's really a wonderful hostess, just just superb. She picked it up from her mom, and she'll invite a bunch of people. And I always know whenever I'm invited to Wendy's house, a guy named Terry's going to be there. Terry and I it don't see as well. Put it mildly, we don't see eye to eye on political views. That's fine. And so after a martini or two, I always go to our hostess, Wendy, and say, hey, I'm going to go talk to Terry about the latest uh, political news. And she says, no, you're not. I said, oh, yes, I am. Watch me. I'm going to go do it. It's never been bad before. She says, no, but I'm just waiting. I said, you keep waiting. So I go. I go and I talk to Terry. Invariably, Wendy will walk around the corner and see Terry and me just laughing our butts off. Because we will have not gone into a conversation to try and convince that the other one is wrong. Our objective here, our issue at hand, is to exchange ideas, learn from each other, be amused by each other, have a great conversation. Because i got to tell you, the political spectrum is huge and there's silliness in all of it. And we can come to that agreement pretty quickly. And then we have fun with it. Now, the point here is, if I focused on Terry and started to tell him what a moron he was, how unreasonable he was, and how every candidate that he supports is wrong, 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 and she has no business being in office, and then he could step back and do the same thing for me. It ain't going to be pretty. It's just going to be a mess. It's going to escalate. And Wendy's going to kick us out of our house. So in business, when we're trying to resolve a conflict, what I'm going to ask you to do, and this is going to be hard. It takes a lot of mental discipline, is when we're feeling attacked, when somebody's coming after us, we're not going to lash back. We're not going to smash that steel ball against the other steel balls. Instead, we're going to say, that's not what we're talking about. You may disagree with me, but what we're trying to do is this deal or resolve this issue. Can we focus on that issue? And that's really where we need to go, because this is not going to get any more constructive. It's going to go downhill. And I don't want to see that happen to you. Now notice, I'm taking a pretty firm tack. I'm not screaming. I'm not calling names. But I'm pointing at that hypothetical issue. This is where we need to focus, not here. So one of the number one, one of the most important ways that conflict is escalated is when we step back and we start attacking the people. 
instead of addressing the issue. Your job is to refocus. If this were a half day or a day long workshop, we'd have a bunch of simulations and we'd talk more about how to do that. But at least I've planted the seed in your mind. Being aware, when you're having these difficult conversations, I'm being attacked, or I'm feeling attacked, or I'm attacking them, stop. Step back and say, you know what? Let's do this differently. Let's talk about this issue, because that's really why we're here. We want this deal to happen. Okay? Is, yes, sir. Is that true with personnel issues as well, or just hard and fast? Negotiation, monetary. I think it. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm hesitating only because I'm conjuring up particular scenarios in my mind for management, and I, I would say yes, it happens with personnel issues. Personnel issues. Let's let's go down that road because it's huge. Um, I spent uh, many years as a mediator uh, mediating Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uh, cases. Those are, in many ways, personnel. You know, discrimination cases, um, wrongful termination based on uh, a person's status. Personnel issues are a real special category, and here's why. They're very personal. You're not just attacking my paycheck. You're attacking me. And if you want to see things happen, and escalate quickly, attack me, attack my status, attack something about me that's very personal. And so where we go is, you've got to avoid that personal attack, or if it comes at you, deflect it and focus on whatever that personnel issue is. Um, I'm thinking about, when you ask a question, I'm thinking about a particular situation. Um, it's actually horrible, I had to uh, terminate somebody um, uh, trust is an issue with me. I, you know, violate my trust, and it's hard to get back. And and uh, this person working in my office had um, uh, lied, like provably. And uh, we had a tough conversation. And he wanted to come after me. He wanted to come after me. He wanted to come after me. I said, listen, I'm not going there. I said, here's what I know, and here's what I'll talk with you about. You know, you were supposed to be in place A. You were in place B. And I have three people who said they saw you there. I mean, right? Yeah, okay. What do I do with that? You know, I, and I asked him that. I said, what do I do with that? I, I, I can't do that. I have to trust people. And I don't trust you. And this is very difficult. So we essentially neg negotiated a departure. Because he was mad. I didn't want this to escalate further. So I said, I want to give him a voice. It's a very helpless place to be when you are the, um, when you're being terminated. And, and, and so uh, I thought, okay, I want to give him some voice here. Uh, I want to give him some power, some control. Uh, so we negotiate in terms of um, departure. So, yeah, does that help? Yeah. All right, good, good, other questions? So yeah, we, we, we need it. This is, this is extraordinarily difficult to do, um, but it, it is doable once you're aware of it. Lying, deceiving, telling half-truths. Now this is an interesting topic. The moderator told you earlier that I teach negotiations. I don't know about what your philosophy is in negotiations, but most of us in the room, if we took an informal poll, would say, hey, of course we deceive each other in negotiations. We bluff. We tell people to look over here when we're really dealing over here. It happens all the time. That's part of the game, right? Yeah. And there's some parameters around there. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But, you know, you can't legally lie about a material fact. You can't legally fail to disclose a material fact. And then we can talk for the rest of our lives about what is material and what is a fact. That's a legal determination. But ladies and gentlemen, we're talking here about resolving conflict. And I want you to get into the mindset of people in conflict 
when somebody, when you're trying to resolve conflict, lies to you, deceives you, tells you a half-truth, what are you going to do? Well, the natural reaction is to get madder. See? I can't trust you either. And it escalates really, really quickly. You see, in a conflict situation, trust begins to dissolve. I have questions about you, whether you're going to do what I ask you to do or what you say you're going to do. And that's trust. Can I trust you? Well, now we introduce into this conflict conversation where we're trying to resolve this problem, and now I'm going to mislead you. Well, the problem here is, all right, now you're just adding to the point. You're just adding to the conflict problem. So, lying, deceiving, telling half-truths. Let me give you some suggestions on having these conversations. When you're trying to resolve conflict and you suspect, you don't know because you can't read minds and you're not going to assume, you suspect that trust may be deteriorating. It is in jeopardy. You be squeaky clean with your information. You be squeaky clean with your facts. You be absolutely dead on precise with your statistics and your numbers. And you have backup if you need to. Because you don't want them to question anything you say. You want to be right up front with them, as transparent as possible, and accurate. Don't give them a single reason for them to question you or not to trust you in this context. We've all been in those conversations, we've all been in those arguments or those discussions where, and I tend to do this, I can be sarcastic, and I'll say something sarcastic, you know, or an exaggeration because I'm trying to be funny. Exaggeration doesn't work. Suddenly, the topic of conversation shifts from solving the problem to, well, Reeves, that's not right. You know that's not right. That's just an exaggeration. And now the topic becomes about something, what I said. And that's not the point. We're losing focus here. So lying, deceiving, half-truths, this is not the time to do it. In your business deals, eh, I'll talk about that tomorrow. I'm going to talk about that at 4 o'clock tomorrow, the art of negotiation. Shameless promotion. We'll talk about bluffing and the ethics around negotiation tomorrow. Not in a conflict situation. I want to talk about the social contract. We enter into contracts in our business all, all the time. That's our, that's our foundational document along with plans and blueprints or I don't I don't even know the technology I do so call it blueprints on the computer I'm talking about the social contract and I'm not talking in a governmental sense by the way what I'm talking about when we enter into business relationships there are a couple of components one is the legal slash economic contract that's the thing that says I'm going to do this for you you're going to pay me X number of dollars. I'm going to build a bridge, I'm going to build a building, and you're going to pay me. Okay? Good. That's the legal contract. The social contract is the underlying relationship. And by that I mean, why are we doing this? How are we going to do this? What's our relationship? What is our intent? in this contract? Well, the obvious answer is to build a bridge or to build a building. No, no, no. Really, in terms of our relationship, what is your intent out of this transaction? What is my intent out of this transaction? Now, that seems kind of deep and fuzzy, but it's an important conversation to have because it is the underlying intention of that contract that relationship that can go wrong. 
I thought your intent in this contract was X, Y, Z. No, 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 I never said that. I know you didn't, but I didn't ask. When I first started getting into law, I would read contracts and I would just roll my eyes. There would be more wherefore and more whereas clauses. You know, it's like three pages of whereas this and whereas that. And I'm thinking, good night, some lawyer was getting paid by the word here. Look at this mess. I'll tell you that I have grown to have more of an appreciation for those whereas clauses. Because if you really read them, and it's not easy reading, but if you really read them, it says, look, here's the deal down here. Here are the provisions and the contractual agreements that we're coming to, but the whereas stuff is, here's how we came together. Here's what our intention is. Here's why we're doing what we're going to do. And I think that's a good conversation to have. Every once in a while, you will find that people's intentions, perhaps not bad, but maybe different. They may have completely different expectations. Well, how can you screw up the expectation of building a bridge? We're not talking about that piece. That's the contract. That's the legal piece. The idea is, how are we going to deal with each other? The other piece of the social contract has to do with the ongoing social contract. That is, we're involved in projects that last for years. We're not doing one-off kinds of transactions. I'm not selling you a used car and then we're going to each go our own separate way. You deal in a business that have ongoing relationships that you really hope are lucrative, both from a monetary standpoint and from a business relationship standpoint. So, I think it's worthwhile having the conversation about when something goes wrong, how are we going to deal with it? And have that conversation when you're in the deal-making stage, when everybody is happy, when we're rational, when the only emotion is excitement and not anger, let's talk about dispute resolution clauses. And I am a little bit biased, not just that binding arbitration clause, but the dispute resolution clause that says, hey, you know what? If something pops up here, can we grab a mediator? Or can we grab an expert in the field to help us resolve whatever that is? is so that we don't have delay causing us time causing his money, causing an owner to get angry. Have the conversation in the deal-making stage. How many of you do that, by the way? I'm curious. It's we on major projects. It's Pardon? in the contracts. Certainly on major projects. It is in the contracts. I hope so. And I hope people pay attention to that and deal with it, but also read those contracts and see if it works. My experience has been that there are 10,000 ways to re resolve disputes but they need to be tailored to the particular project, particular people, particular needs of those disputes. So pay attention to that as well. So, paying attention to the uh, contracts, dispute resolution. The other thing is, and maybe this is in the contract, but please make sure, are there check-in times? Are there mechanisms for us to say, hey, every X number of days or months, or at every phase or particular phases of a project, we're going to get back together around the table and just do a debrief. What's going well? What's not going well? What do we need to fix? And it's not a blame game. It's got to be a focus on making sure that the social contract is in intact, that our relationship continues, and that this project is on time and under budget have those conversations. And again, what we're trying to do is put together a mechanism before we get angry, before things get escalated, before we get lawyers, and before we wind up in years in court litigation, which will not work for our projects. So the legal contract is the what we're going to do. The social contract is how we're going to do it. What are our expectations? How are we going to resolve conflict? How are we going to do some preventive measures 
around avoiding or preventing conflict. This is one of my favorite, perhaps because I'm a lawyer. We just talked about the contract. We talked about the legal contract. And my observations through the years is this. When a problem crops up, one of the first things that people do is they pick up the people they pick up the piece of paper that's the contract it's actually several pages probably pretty thick and say well let's go to the contract and see what it says woo it's not in the contract or this is what the contract says that's a perfectly rational way to try to resolve the problem Eight times out of 10, it's not gonna work. Anybody know why? I'll tell you. Because it's legal language and everybody interprets it differently. Good lawyers can turn all kinds of meanings into words. And that's not a negative thing, that's one of their talents. But the other piece of this is contracts are rights-based. They give the parties certain legal rights. Well, how do you find out in a rights-based conflict who's right and who's wrong? When there's a disagreement, how do you do it? Huh? Go to a judge. You go to court. There you go. If we try to resolve every dispute on a rights-based basis, we're going to wind up in court. The project isn't going to go on. We're going to litigate the thing to death. And i got to tell you, I've handled some construction litigation. You all may know this, but it is not inexpensive, and it is time-consuming, and it is distracting. And the project comes to a halt, or at least is impaired. So Reeves, what do we do about it? Focus less on the contract. Don't discard it. That's the baseline. That's the foundation. Here's what the legal rights of the parties are. Now let's talk about an interest-based solution. What do we need? What is the core problem here? What is the core question? What is the core concern? What is the core thing that we need to talk about and resolve? With a focus on keeping the project on track and under budget and on time. That is the focus. Not the law, but how do we resolve this? Lawyers tend to focus on the law because that's what they're trained to do. That's not a bad thing. Um, I'm in the middle of a mediation right now with two not-for-profit uh, organizations. I have both boards at the mediation table. They're arguing about the rights of a play, neither of which nobody on these boards wrote the play. None of them, I, I don't get the playwright at the table yet, but I've invited her. Each not-for-profit has a lawyer. I have welcomed the lawyer, because what I know about copyright and playwrights nothing. It's not my job. I'm the mediator. I'm just trying to generate some possible resolutions to this. But I rely on the lawyers because they can advise the clients, here's what your legal rights are. So now you're educated and can make informed decisions. But that doesn't put the end of it. That doesn't stop the conversation. Use that information and then go back and say, okay, now I know what my legal rights are. I know that if we can't reach a deal, I go to court and my lawyer tells me I'm going to win or I'm going to lose. Because those are my legal rights. But we don't want to go there. Neither one of us do. And so what I've told these not for profit boards, I said, you know, talk to the lawyers. Get an idea of what your legal rights are. But I want to bring you back 
We're going to have a few meetings and explore some other ways. We're going to get the playwright involved also. And she's going to have a lawyer. And we're going to look at some ways that we might be able to get this resolved. Because all of you have good intentions. And they really do. But how are you going to share this? How are you going to get credit, give credit, etc.? Those are the questions. And we're going to focus on that. The other piece of advice I'd give you along these lines is this. If you get lawyers involved, get the right lawyers involved. Now your firm, your company, you might have your favorites. And that's great. That's a good relationship to have. The problem is, is that some lawyers tend to be what I call the warrior lawyers. They want to litigate. I have a very, very dear friend that I've known since we were little baby lawyers. I've worked with him. He loves to be in the courtroom. And courts are absolutely good, legitimate, important ways of resolving disputes. In my view, as a last resort. Try every other means. The problem is if we get the wrong lawyer in the room, who tends to be that competitive warrior lawyer, then he or she starts to start that escalating cycle by their behavior, by their tone, by their argument, not discussion, but argument, a focus on the legal rights. You're going to lose. We're going to win. And it tends to escalate very quickly. So get the right lawyer in the room. Make sure that that lawyer is going to be one who can have a conversation and do some problem solving. Not ignore the legal rights, but take those legal rights, advise you of those legal rights, and then help you and the other parties come to some creative ways of solving this problem. And focus on the problem. All right, here's my lawyer speech. Oh, I have to do assessment questions. So this is a pop quiz. I'm gonna call on you, I have a seating chart, just like I do in class. True or false, people are people, and we can't change the way they are. That is true. We can influence them, but we can't change them. That's good. So far, so good. True or false, past disagreements are in the past and have nothing to do with our current project or relationship. Oh, oh that was perfect. It's awesome. You guys are doing great. You're going to pass. True or false, it's okay to lie when dealing with a business partner. Think about it. Okay, what's the answer? False. Just not a good idea. Especially in a conflict situation. I don't think it's a good idea anyway. True or false, we have a written contract and we can just rely on the contract to manage any disagreements. True or false? False. Just talk about it. All right, thank you. I think that's the end for now, but I have some other assessment questions toward the end, so um, don't close your books yet. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, this was one of my favorites. It's one of my favorites because we all have experienced it. We have either been the sender or we have been the receiver. I had a great conversation with, um, she's actually a neighbor of mine. She was uh, in a dispute with an alderman in the suburb where we live, just outside of St. Louis. And uh, she was very politically active, and she was in quite a dispute, and it was escalating quickly. And uh, uh, I wasn't really asked about it in a professional capacity, but she just brought it up while we were talking in the yard one day, and I said, what's going on? She said, so they're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing that. And I just had this knockdown, drag out fight with, you know, we'll call him Sam. I don't know what his name was. You know, Sam the Alderman. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah. Tough personality. Yeah, he is. I said, so where'd you leave it? He said, well, we're just, you know, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to do next. And I said, oh, what? She said, uh, I'm going to go on Facebook and I'm going to plaster all the stuff he said to me all over Facebook. And I'm going to say, this guy doesn't deserve to hold office. And I said, Jen, that's her name. 
as a gentleman. That's an idea. I said, um, what, do you, what do you want to accomplish by doing that? I mean, you want to get this resolved, right? Because you're going to continue to work with us. You're very active in the city politics. She says, yeah. I said, what do you want to accomplish by that? Well, I, I just wanted to know that I'm pissed. Tell him. I said, but you wouldn't be just telling him. And may, may, may not be telling him at all. You're telling the world. What does that accomplish? Well, nothing really. That's right. I'd be glad to help you have that conversation if you like. But don't go on Facebook. People do that, and it's human nature. This happens in the workplace sometimes. Not often, but it does happen. I'm mad at my boss. I want to go out, and I want to tell the world. And what happens is I start to get likes. Everybody that I communicate with on social media agrees with me because all they have is my side of the story. And by the way, people on Facebook are my friends. They're not going to disagree with me. I feel good. I feel justified. There's a real psychological phenomenon happening. The problem is, it escalates badly. Imagine if you were the boss and you found out about this. It would not be good for the business relationship, may I say. The real issue for me is the email. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've walked into an organization as a mediator, workplace thing, maybe it's a couple teams that aren't getting along, they just need some conversation about how they're going to, you know, it's a, it's a team of engineers and uh, a team of, uh, of accountants, you know, people who speak, or IT people and, um, you know, other professionals. They just speak different languages, that's fine, they see problems differently. So naturally there can be some conflict there. And I help facilitate those conversations, that's great, it's very easy. To have. But it's amazing how those escalate without help sometimes. There's a professional pride there. And when I come into an organization, I'm often presented with the, what I call the manila folder. It's always a manila folder. And it's handed to me. And sometimes it's this thick, and sometimes it's this thick. And it's usually presented with the words, look at what they wrote to me. Look, just read it. Take a look at it. And I do. Seven times out of 10, from objective eyes, I'm thinking, there's nothing here. He asked you a question, and you got mad. Sometimes it is poisonous. And we feel comfortable doing that because it's so safe. I'm not in their face. I'm not in their space. I can sit here just like I have in front of me right now. I have a keyboard and I can hit send and it goes across the world or it goes next door to the office. I don't know, but I feel good. It's like driving, folks. I've had conversations with other drivers because I'm wrapped around steel and glass to the tune of two or 3,000 pounds and I feel invincible. They can't hurt me. And they can't hear me. If I had to have that conversation in person, I'd behave differently. So, you know what I'm going to tell you. When you're in a conflict situation, step away from the keyboard. Some people will advise, write that responsive email, and then sit on it for 24 hours. And I'm telling you a minimum. 24 hours. And then before you hit send, go back and read it. I would bet 99% of the time, I'm almost going to go to 100% of the time, you will make some edits before you send it. The other piece of it is this. When you get one of those emails that you think is offensive, don't respond. Walk away. 
you see, we read text, we read things, we absorb all of our information, whether it's text, whether it's visual information, whether it's something we hear, we process it according to what's in our brain. And if we're mad at someone, we're going to tend to process that stuff negatively. We're going to subconsciously put every negative spin on those words on that screen. And it may not be the intent at all. They may actually be trying to make up to us or to resolve the problem. But if we're mad at them, we're not going to interpret that way. So walk away. Step two is talk to them. Don't do this in email. Don't do this in email. Talk to them. If they're down the hall, get up and go to their office. I am amazed, ladies and gentlemen, the number of people who have their offices 50 feet away and they have an argument via email. Get up and go talk to them. Why don't we? Because it's like that guy in the head in the sand. I want to avoid it. It's scary. But all of you want to resolve this. Working together. So, step away, have a conversation. If you're dealing with somebody in another state, another location, video conferencing is amazing and easy. I have clients, I have a family business that I work with. It's a farming business over here across the river in Illinois. Three sisters, one brother. Two sisters in Arizona, one sister in Ohio, one brother in Thailand. I facilitate their family meetings. They love each other and cannot do business together. Although they're doing a lot better. They're doing a lot better. So I facilitate. We do it Skype. It costs us nothing. Absolutely. Do it. All right? Don't be afraid. The other thing we're going to find out is when we go into that office or we have this conversation, this is the really cool thing. Two things have happened in my experience. One is I'll get up, and I've, I've been in a management position where I've seen coworkers going back and forth at each other, and I'll stand up or I'll just write an email and say, meet me in the conference room in five minutes, both of you please. Gentle, objective. I'm not exaggerating. They come into the conference room and they both say, Jim, I'm really glad you stopped that. That was getting out of control. Okay? So, step away, have the conversation. Telephones, video conference, in some way communicate other than texting or email. The other thing I do want you to think about is think about the best way to have this communication. Email, text, letters, those are all great. And I'll tell you the response I often get. Well, Reeves, you're a lawyer. You know it's a good idea to put things in writing, especially when they're doing all these bad things. Yeah, it is a good idea. As a lawyer, that's great. Have that record. Have that writing so that later on, if somebody needs to testify to it, they can. Uh -uh. I don't buy it. Resolve the conflict first. Have the conversation first. And then document the conversation. I'm so glad we had email. I'm so glad we had a chance to talk, blah, 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 blah. I'm glad we, were able to, we seem to be disagreeing on these two points, but I think we can get them through this, blah, 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 blah. You know, if I've said anything that is, doesn't meet your understanding, please let me know. We still have the writing, but we've had the human communication. It's one of my favorites. All right, I'm going into listening now. We're not going to get soft and fuzzy, but we are going to talk about listening. I told you I listen to a lot of talk shows, sometimes on the radio. Uh, the, the television I've become a little disgusted with because it, it makes me anxious. But we've seen talk, um, we've heard it on the radio and talk shows where you know people argue with each other and they talk over each other. And, and, it, and, it, and it, it, it does two things for me. It, it kind of makes me anxious because I'm thinking this is really stupid, but it sells airtime. 
The other piece of me says this is awesome because it's going to keep us mediators in work for a long, long time. If this is how people think, this is how conflict is to be destroyed. This is great. I love it. So, when we're in a conflict situation, shut up and listen. State your case, state your perspective. I try to avoid saying state your side of the case. I try to avoid saying that. What are you thinking about this? Say it objectively and in an even tone of voice. Keep in mind Newton's cradle. You want to drop that steel ball firmly but gently because the reaction you want is firm and gentle back. The rule of reciprocity. Got it? All right. So, number one, don't interrupt. Shut up and listen. And then state your perspective. Now, that sounds easy. It's not. Here's a couple of reasons why. What if they say something you just flat out disagree with? You think they really are wrong, right? Like, provably wrong. That's fine. A couple of different ways to handle this. Um, a lot of you, not a lot of you, but some of you in the room um, uh, are, are old enough to remember the uh, old detective series, Columbo. Anybody? Oh, good. I'm so thankful. Appreciate you. So Columbo was this bumbling Los Angeles homicide detective. He had a rumpled coat. And he always walked around like this, and he smoked an old stogie, and he always had his head, you know, he always looked confused. I mean, he was just a mess. Brilliant guy. Brilliant detective. I tend to be like Columbo because it really is just natural for me. I, I tend to live in a state of perpetual confusion. And so one way I like to handle this is, is you know, I think we're leaving out some information here. Or what you're telling me makes sense, but it's not what I know or what I think I know. So let's talk about that. Here are the three things I know. Or at least this is the impression I have. You see what I'm doing? I'm exchanging information. I'm not attacking the person. And I'm not cross-examining them. Because what I ultimately want to, them to do I'm going to behave in a way that is going to elicit information from them, not get a screaming match going. Because information is key in resolving disputes and negotiating deals. <laughs> There's tons of information and research out there that says good negotiators and good conflict resolvers listen substantially more than they talk. Seems counterintuitive. Because in a conflict situation, we want to defend, 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 defend. We're going to pull out the sword and let them have it. Problem is, they're going to pull out their sword too. And then it's going to escalate into worse weapons. So we're going to control this. And we're going to take a deep breath. And the other piece that I'm going to tell you is we're going to be curious. Be curious. Many of us have heard the concept of being empathetic listeners, active listeners. Great concept. I have to tell you, I don't know a single human being in a conflict situation who wants to be empathetic to the other side. I don't want to get into your shoes because they don't fit and they're ugly. I don't care what your perspective is. That's the typical situation, and that can be why empathetic listening is so difficult. When you listen to someone, and then you reflect back what they've said. It can be very powerful. So shift it a little bit. Be curious. Really? Why are they behaving that way, I wonder? This is a, this is a mental exercise. You're not saying it. What are they behaving that way? What do they say that? What do they know I don't know? Anything? I'm not going to assume that they know anything. I'm not going to assume <coughs> they're wrong. What can I learn from them? Curiosity begets learning. It opens the mind, and it also starts the process of forming questions in our mind so that our brain kicks in before our emotions do. And that's critical. We talked about that about an hour ago. 
Our brains need to kick in first. How do we do that? We engage the brain through questions. How do we engage the brain through questions? Being curious. I have gotten to the point where, and I've had some real screamers at the negotiation table. I mean some real screamers. And I get amused by it. I try really hard not to smile at them, because that'll escalate. But I kind of think, wow, what is with you? What is going on? And it's not a negative thing, but I'm thinking, what's going on with you? And you'll be amazed the answers to that question sometime. Sometimes if they have such a weak position, they're covering for it. Sometimes they know they've done something wrong, and they're a little bit embarrassed and they've lost face. So they're covering it up with a defensive move, a very powerful presentation. That's all right. The other piece that I'm going to ask you to do is negotiate about how we're going to negotiate. And here's what I mean. We're going to shut up. We're going to be curious. And we're going to negotiate about how we're going to negotiate. I'll get to the train wreck here in just a second. So by that I mean, you know, this is not working for me, and this is exactly what I'd say. If we're going to fix this deal, and we're going to resolve this, we're going to have to work together in some way or another. I don't want to be attacked, and I don't want to attack you. Don't call me names. Let's figure out, and let's negotiate how we're going to have this conversation. And I tell my students to do that, and they laugh at me all the time. Negotiate about negotiating? Yeah. Lay down some ground rules about how we're going to have this conversation. The other thing we tend to do, and I only have a couple more slides because I only got a few more minutes, six minutes, is this. Sometimes we go down a bad path. We know things are going wrong because now you're aware. You're looking for the signs. You know this is a bad thing. And we keep going. We keep going. There's this weird psychological phenomenon of commitment in which we just say, I'm going to keep going down this track, even when the track is ending. And this is what happened. <coughs> and so, what we need to do is be aware. We mentioned that an hour ago, and then mentioned again. Be aware something is not going well. Stop trying to win the conversation. There's a tendency for us to say, okay, this is not going well, but by golly, if we're all going to die, I'm going to die the winner. You know, we're going down in flames, but I'm going to be the last person down. Don't go there. It's going to escalate. We got a problem. And then I want you to redirect to the issue at hand. Redirect that we talked about earlier. What is that problem that we're trying to solve? And then if you must negotiate about how to negotiate so that it's a more civil tone, let them know this isn't working. I would rather have a more civil conversation. Can we do that? Don't call them names. Don't, don't tell them they're bad. Don't tell them that they're unreasonable. Say, I need a more civil conversation. And I'm feeling a bit attacked here. So I want to get this fixed. I think you do too, because there's a lot of money at stake and business relationships as well. <laughs> Let's get this fixed. And then that's what that last piece is, setting it in a tone of reciprocity and influence saying it in a very straightforward, firm, but not escalating tone. Finally, my last behavior that escalates, guarantee. The obvious one is reciprocating bad behavior. We've been talking about it all afternoon long, and this is the last one. If you let yourself go, okay, that's fine. You're going to call me a name, I'm calling you a name. You're going to lash out, I'm lashing out right back. i got to tell you, that's going to be a really short, nasty conversation. And you're going to accomplish nothing. And we will see you in court. So, don't reciprocate. Keep in mind that cycle of escalation. And also keep in mind Newton's cradle. You grab that ball before it hits the other balls. Settle it, and then let it more gently. How do you do that? Be curious what's going on here and being aware. Engage your brain. Don't act on emotion.
So I have an, a rhetorical assessment question, which is not required, but I did it anyway. It's 2.57 p.m. Rhetorical question of the top or 12, I, I don't know, top 10 to a guy, I lost count. Escalating behaviors, which ones or more might you work on to avoid escalating conflict in the future? So I like to ask these questions both of you and of my students and people that I work with in training and workshops. Say, you know what? All of you, I hope, got one or two nuggets out of this hour and a half. Step back a bit and say, you know, I need to be more aware about this or that. Or maybe this is something I do. And as you go forward, both throughout this conference and in your business and in your personal relationships, pay attention to the kinds of conversations you're having. All right? Here's the uh, code, PDH, and I thank you very much. Have a great afternoon.